Are you looking for a stress-free summer? HelloFresh sends you foolproof step-by-step -step recipes and fresh pre-portioned ingredients to make mealtimes a summer breeze. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com MLM16. You walk into a room. There you find thousands of people garnered in colorful sashes waiting patiently to begin a week-long program of self-enlightenment and growth. Like the others, you paid thousands of dollars to experience the new craze sweeping the world. The classes begin with a recited 12 point statement from the group before a leader comes on stage to teach you the ways of becoming, in essence, a higher being. By the end of the experience, you're met with someone asking about your commitment to the group. You want to become better, don't you? Start your own business, build your self-worth and get over past trauma. So you, along with thousands of other people, agree to continue paying thousands of dollars for each class. But wait, you can also move up in rank within the community by recruiting others. Doesn't that sound familiar? Not only can you continue taking the classes, but hey, maybe you can teach them too. Recruiting new members allows you to raise in rank, allegedly gain commission, and of course, become a better person. All of this seems pretty familiar when we're talking about MLMs. You experience something once, then bring people in for some sort of reward. But this one is different because this one is Nexium. As you try to recruit new members, you are told to cut off anyone that tells you no. Meanwhile, it turns out that those people that were supposed to be getting commission, well, they weren't. Then it just, but it goes so much deeper, so much darker than that. Nexium wasn't just your typical MLM, it was a cult. It was a cult that ruined countless lives and recruited people to a life of horror. Hidden behind the typical self-help MLM was something much worse, and it took decades for the truth to come out. Hello and welcome to Multilevel Mondays. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about, once again, the very infamous MLM slash cult, Nexium. We've spoken about them once before the trials were concluded and then we briefly spoke about them again just to really cover what happened in the trial. And now that both have really been completed and we have a fuller picture, I wanted to revisit Nexium and essentially give one conclusive episode of the complete story from start to finish. The story of Nexium is full of shocking information and it can be difficult to talk about and to listen to. With that being said, I do want to let you know that there will be mentions of mental, physical, and sexual abuse scattered throughout the entirety of the episode. If you're not in the right headspace to hear about these things at the present moment, feel free to check out any other number of my other episodes, but this one will not be the one for you. Now, the story of Nexium goes back all the way to 1998 when Keith Rainier and Nancy Salzman decided to team up and create a self-help program for the ages. Keith claimed to be a genius and was even reported in the Guinness Book of World Records for having one of the highest IQs in the world. And for the record, he was not a newcomer to the MLM space. Back in the 1980s, he had actually run a pyramid scheme that brought in about $33 million a year before it eventually collapsed. His charismatic personality mixed with Nancy's history as a psychiatric nurse and consultant brought people in droves, hoping that the two leaders could unlock potential success that they could only dream of. Together, Nancy and Keith developed a program that nearly 16,000 people enrolled in. Nexium described itself as a community guided by humanitarian principles that seek to empower people. Most people signed up for the Nexium Executive Success Programs, they gladly shelled out the $7,500 or more it took to attend the program and committed themselves fully as they were told how they could actualize human potential. They signed NDAs and alienated themselves from the world, their friends, and their families. In 13 hour long classes, the students would garner colorful sashes that signified their ranks. According to Forbes, people were instructed to stand to show respect when a higher ranking member entered the room. When Keith made his appearance, they were taught to bow. This kind of standing and bowing type ritual is just an immediate no from me. If this was supposed to be a conference or consulting type of experience, this missed the mark. It's immediately weird to me that you would bow to someone walking into the room. And no, for the record, I'm not referring to cultural forms and norms. Like in Japan, if I was conducting business, I would absolutely bow and so would the other person. But this is more coming from not the stance of common respect or courtesy to a culture's beliefs, but this is more of a, you must respect me because I'm smarter than you. And it's got that culty religious vibe to it. And it's not like a respect thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but to me, there's a distinct difference. 
But this is not the weirdest part, and we haven't really even cracked that open yet. Keith also required his followers to call him Vanguard and was reportedly met with a kiss on the mouth from each woman. He denied that this ever happened at first, but given the fact that he seems to deny doing anything wrong at this point, it's not very shocking. Every day, they would recite a 12 point mission statement, which read in part, there are no ultimate victims. Therefore, I will not choose to be a victim. For those who have experienced any sort of trauma or just people who find it difficult to survive in a world surrounded by constant stress, this idea of reframing their mindset away from a victim mentality was enticing and almost addictive. It also made it easier for Keith and Nancy to complete the horrific acts they did later on. If you convince people that they shouldn't consider themselves victims, it's a lot easier to persuade them to not speak out or acknowledge the horrific things done to them for fear of shaming from the group. And they knew this, so keep that in mind as we continue. Another part of the Nexium program was calling people parasites. Not so shockingly, parasites are the people who went against the group, either from the inside or the outside world. In the patent application for Nexium's program, Rainier wrote, all parasitic strategies lower self-esteem and therefore destroy value. It is our intent to rid the world of those things that destroy value. We can do this by modeling effort strategies with our own behavior and helping others learn to use them. This is spreading the mission. There's something about the fact that he wrote that in a damn patent application that just really creeps me out. Maybe it's because I know what happens later, or maybe it's because it sounds eerily familiar to the language used by other cults. And you know, like the term suppressives used for people that are disloyal to the group that shall not be named. You know, the if you know, you know kind of thing. With thousands of people signing up to complete the programs, others with massive notoriety began to invest as well. The two daughters of Seagram's billionaire who had notoriously referred to Nexium as a cult became target number one for the group. They reportedly invested over $100 million. Actress Alison Mack joined in after becoming infatuated with Keith at a young age. And don't worry, I will return to this. Then there was also the continuous stream of business executives, some former members of government and others of high notoriety who rushed in to see what the fuss was about, all of which worked tirelessly to recruit new members in the hope to gain commission and rank from the group. And spoiler alert, only those at the very tippy top of the group were making any money. Others later stated they were owed over $2 million in lost commissions. But given everything else going on in the organization, this is by far the smallest infraction. Still, I wanted to point it out all the same. But Nexium's curriculum really did lay the groundwork for the horrors of the sorority that came later. In the early years of the program, two mental health experts weighed in, calling it thought reform and brainwashing. Rational inquiry as trademarked by Keith aimed at breaking down his subjects psychologically. It reframed their thinking and taught many to see the self-proclaimed spiritual leader as some sort of God that could solve not only their problems, but the world's problems as well. Keith would heavily rely on the narrative that he was some sort of spiritual being, even telling some of his followers that he didn't drive because he gave off some sort of magical signal that sets off radar detectors. And I'm sorry, but that's hilarious because this man is insane to believe that. The more deeply involved with the group these members become, the more they tried to sell classes to their friends or family members. And if they didn't agree to join, they were eventually cut off from any communication for being so-called parasites. After years of laying this type of groundwork, Nexium would become even worse. In the late 2000s, two separate groups for the men and women in the Nexium community were developed as ways for followers to become even more involved and hopefully reach higher enlightenment. However, DOS or Dominus Obsequious Sororium, which literally translates to Lord over the obedient female companions would become a nightmare for those that join. Alison Mack, once a renowned television star famous for her role in Smallville turned into a master in a sex cult. Brought into the group by fellow actress, Christian Kruk, Mack had fallen in love with Nexium and its notorious leader almost immediately. She passionately tried to recruit other famous women to join in like Kelly Clarkson and Emma Watson. In a letter she tells Watson, I participate in a unique human development and women's movement I'd love to tell you about. As a fellow actress, I can relate so well to your vision and what you want to see in the world. I think we could work together. Let me know if you're willing to chat. Her infatuation with Keith is really apparent too. If you watch videos of the two of them discussing empowerment, creativity, and fear, she gazes at him with the look of adoration. Multiple times during the interview between the two entitled The Authentic Human, 
you see Mac break down in tears as Keith finishes his explanation of some abstract way of thinking. It's clear that she would do anything for him. And based on what we know and what's to come, it means pretty much anything. Looking back now though, those videos between the two are eerie. The way she looks at him could easily be described as idol worship. But this would all turn into something far darker as she became one of the leading forces in what can only be described as a nightmare for all those who were involved. Mac, along with many other supposed masters, sold DOS as a dream group for women. It was supposed to be a woman's empowerment paradise. Like many cults before them, Nexium and DOS preyed on women that had past trauma in their lives. They took their insecurities and promised a way out, promised a better life, a happier future. Women were told repeatedly that DOS would teach them how to live a more fulfilling life. Certainly it was unorthodox, but it would help them overcome their intimacy issues. And Bill listened as he preached about the importance of women in leadership and became enamored with his supposed appreciation for them. One of his victims later said that his thing was always that the company would be better if there were women in power because women are stronger. Women are this, women are that. Sarah Edmondson, a defector from the group, said she had been presented DOS by none other than Lauren Salzman, Nancy's daughter, after she arrived in Vancouver to teach Nexium classes. She said it was a secret sorority that had been developed to be a force of good. They would work together to influence elections and overcome their fears and weaknesses that Rainier said were common to women, an over-emotional nature, a failure to keep promises, and an embrace of the role of victim. And excuse my crassness for a moment here, but fuck this guy. This bastard mixed in language that supposedly empowers women while simultaneously victimizing them and blaming them for women problems. Meanwhile, the problems he included are both incredibly fucking stereotypical and horrifically victim blaming. The role of the victim he attributes to women isn't taken on willingly by anyone. It's forced on them. Nobody wants to be a victim. But Edmondson, like the others, said the group was portrayed to her as a badass bitch boot camp, which is quite a quote. Now for some women, empowerment wasn't necessarily the goal. It was just safety. In a world where women are persecuted and targeted constantly, Nexium was portrayed as a safe haven. It was supposed to be a community where they finally felt okay, away from the pressures of everyday society. Mac herself said in a world full of self-empowerment rhetoric and the constant pressure for women to be perfect being made to feel powerless under Keith gave her a sense of freedom. He convinced the women that through his control and their supposed connection with him, they could be free. He would heal them of their pain and teach them how to rid the pressures of womanhood. This group would be a place where women have their own society, a place where other than Keith, men would play no role. So they joined in, unaware of the horrors that awaited them in the future. It wasn't until after they agreed to join that everything changed. What started as love, infatuation, and a promise for a better life quickly turned into a horror story of sex slavery and abuse. But by this point, many of the women were already convinced that they had to follow every step, every rule, and every command to achieve freedom within themselves. As time went on, this was reinforced through constant pressure, punishment, and torture. The second that women agreed to join this so-called women empowerment community, they were met with an initial demand. They were commanded to send collateral to prove their undying commitment to the group. This collateral included sexually explicit photos, videos, and letters written by the woman that would harm their family should they ever be released, including confessions that a member of their family had sexually assaulted them, even if it never happened. Women would also turn over their bank account information and permission for masters to inherit their possessions. And you might be thinking, big fucking red flag here. But just remember that by this point, this group had been portrayed as the key to a perfect life. The collateral seemed like no big deal at first. It was simply a commitment to loyalty to the group, a way for the women to prove that they believed in this stuff. Giving up their possessions and a bit of their privacy seemed like a small price to pay for a lifetime of freedom and power. Of course, later, this collateral would be held over their heads if they tried to escape the horrific ordeal, a situation the woman could not imagine at the time. After they agreed and completed the first step, it was time to participate in the initiation ritual. The brutal practice of branding women with Keith's initials was thought to be a consensual practice by many of the women. However, they were unaware of what was being placed on their bodies and it was excruciatingly painful. 
Still, a moment of pain seemed like a small ask for the promise of fulfillment. Many were told that it had been the other woman's idea to hold the ceremony. It was supposedly a bond of sisterhood through pain. This supposed sacred ritual was performed the exact same way every time. Women were tied to the table by their sisters and told to recite these words. Please brand me, it would be an honor, an honor I want to wear for the rest of my life. This had been specifically designed by Keith in collusion with Alice and Mac. While discussing how this ritual would be conducted, Keith told Mac that they should probably say that before they're held down so it doesn't seem like they were being coerced. Ultimately, it went exactly as he predicted. The women were unaware that this script had been predetermined to convince them not to leave. So they continued, convinced by a monster and master manipulator that this pain was proof of their love. A text from Keith also said that he was aware women were being branded with his initials and read, it was not intended as my initials, but they rearranged it slightly for tribute. If it were Abraham Lincoln's or Bill Gates initials, no one would care. From that point on, life became a constant stream of rules, abuse, and punishment. After their branding, the women were required to wear collars or other forms of jewelry to symbolize their obedience to masters. Again, this was seen and portrayed as an honor. They were the lucky ones. Their obedience was freedom. It was happiness. At least, that's what they were told. This constant reminder that their abuse and the rules were an honor is a common tactic in cults. The BBC produced an article with ex-cult members, and in it, the men and women described feeling vulnerable before joining. They were looking for a place that felt like home, a place where they would be loved and accepted. And at first, that's what cults offered them, much like Nexium did. But it wasn't until after they were already deeply engulfed that everything changed. Throughout all the abuse, they would introduce self-doubt. If you object, it must be because you don't want a better version of yourself. If you associate with people outside the group, you could fall back into a less enlightened version of yourself. One woman said the cult compared it to being an alcoholic. They said, once an alcoholic gets clean, they can't really hang out with their old drinking buddies at the old bars. The constant reassurance that abuse was done to help them and it was an honor to be in the cult was constantly repeated. This was the same rhetoric used over and over again to convince women in Nexium that no matter how appalling and painful their experiences are, it happened to make them better. The longer the women remained, the worse it got. Allison Mack reportedly starved women until they were skinny enough to fit Keith's sexual ideal. One woman said she had lived on a 500 calorie a day diet for a year. She was told to do this until she reached 107 pounds and her extreme dieting was portrayed as a way to prove her obedience to the cult. For 24 hours a day, the women were required to be at the beck and call of their masters. They would suffer through early morning and middle of the night readiness drills to prove their commitment to answering texts. During these drills, the masters would simply text them a question mark to which they were required to respond, ready M. It's very possible this was done for another reason as multiple studies have shown that sleep deprivation leads to disruption in emotional control and decision-making. This makes it easier to control people and is often regarded as a form of torture. When the women disobeyed in any manner, they were punished through the most horrific of measures. Some were punished with starvation if they did not respond to a text from their master within 60 seconds. When one woman reportedly showed interest in another man, she was kept in a room for over a year. Every aspect of life was controlled. Basic tasks required permission, even going to the bathroom or eating. Unfortunately, I can't believe that this is something that can be said after going through all of that, but it somehow gets worse. When Camilla was 13 years old, her parents became involved with the life coaching program Nexium. Of course, at this time, they were unaware of the brutal history of the group's past and present and saw Keith as the harmless genius that he portrayed himself to be. At first, Camilla's parents admired Keith and pushed her to talk to him so she didn't appear rude. But at 15 years old, Keith began to sexually abuse her. He had told her she was special and placed her in a home with older women to learn and grow. In there, Camilla faced the same horrors as the other women. She remained isolated from her family. Her diet was controlled by Keith and her attempts to seek psychiatric help were blocked. Eventually, like the others, she was branded with Keith's initials. By the time she got out of her teens, she had tried many times to leave, but was stuck in the cycle of abuse that had been created. Camilla said, he acted happy, loving, and caring when I showed signs of falling back in line. 
but as soon as I expressed again a desire to leave, he'd become a monster. He knew the things that mattered most to me and what I feared, and he used both to control me. According to his many victims, this was a constant and skilled tactic by Keith. He could find anyone's insecurities quickly, and once discovered, he would exploit them. With every action and word, he found a way to convince the women that he was the only one who could free them from their insecurities, the only one that could make them safe. Camilla and her three sisters all suffered abuse at the hands of Keith. One of them was the one who had been kept in the room for over a year. Unfortunately, they were far from being the only ones. You see, his history with underage girls actually goes back decades. He had been accused of sexually assaulting multiple underage girls at one point and used the excuse that a girl's soul is much older than her biological age to justify this. And he called the girl a Buddhist goddess meant to be with him. And I just don't think I really have any words for how absolutely infuriating, sickening, and just, I I don't know what other descriptor use. This, This is disgusting. If a girl is 12 or 15, then she is 12 or 15 years old. That's it. The old soul justification has been used over and over and over again. And frankly, I'm sick of it being used as a way for people, usually men, to explain their disgusting behavior. No, 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 I I get it. The body is 12, but the soul is over 18. That's still a 12 year old girl's body. I don't know what to tell you, man. It is not a justification. Unfortunately, the founding of Nexium and DOS seemed to have a way for Keith to lure in and abuse women under the guise of helping them and Mac helped move this narrative along. She convinced women to join Nexium, disguising it as female empowerment. But soon she was helping to convince women that they had to sleep with or seduce Keith for their emotional development. One woman who simply went by the name Jay said that Mac had told her to seduce Keith. She framed it as the only way Jay could get over her past trauma of being sexually assaulted by an uncle when she was 12 years old. She said, this is going to help you get rid of all your sexual abuse trauma. Mac then encouraged Jay to have sex with Keith and allow him to videotape her. Jay was told, I will give you permission to enjoy it. Another woman, Sylvie, detailed her experiences during her 13 years with Nexium. When she first committed to joining DOS as a slave, she was instructed to ask Keith to photograph her and to go along with whatever else happened. So she did as she was told. As she went to meet Keith in a house, she was told to undress. She didn't want this. She didn't want any sexual contact with Keith. It wasn't what she had signed up for. But she said she felt powerless in her role and that she had to follow all of her master commands. So Keith performed oral sex on her afterwards, saying she was now an official part of the inner circle. Sylvie felt forced to show affection to Keith. It was her way of survival. And she was convinced this was the only way she would be the best slave and avoid punishment. She said, if I was the best slave, things would work out for me. Not only were women repeatedly instructed to have sex with Keith, but they were also made to get abortions against their will if they became pregnant. Women were assigned to have sex with Keith while others were required to perform sexual acts on their masters. They were told that pictures and videos would be taken to prove their devotion to the group. But later, if any attempted to leave, it was used against them. Near the end of the whole ghastly ordeal, there was even talk of building a literal dungeon in the basement of the sorority house. But after years of this repetitive abuse, mind control and manipulation, it all started to come to an end in 2017. Though there had been rumors for years of what was going on in Nexium and multiple people and organizations had tried to bring attention to the wickedness that occurred behind closed doors at the supposed self-empowerment organization, nothing could compare to the truth. In 2017, women began speaking out and begged authorities in New York to investigate. They told their stories loud, the branding, the collateral, the torture. Finally, when a report detailing the branding ritual became widespread, a criminal investigation of Keith finally began. Like the absolute coward he is, Keith ran, moving to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Thankfully, his plan to avoid any repercussions or justice for his actions failed. After five months of running and hiding like the little chicken shit he is, he was arrested and sent to Brooklyn. There, he and others would finally face some accountability for the nightmare they had spearheaded for years. And before we go on to talk about the trials and sentencing and the aftermath in terms of the legality of what happened to Nexium, I'm gonna go ahead and place today's sponsors here. Truthfully, there is no good place to place today's sponsors. So I just tried to put them as close as I could to the end of the episode so that there's not gonna be this weird jarring of, hey, we're talking about a bunch of this sensitive stuff and then here's a random ad. So I tried to get all of the really tough stuff out of the way and then this kind of last section. So here are the ads, and then let's go on to the trials and sentencing. 
Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. The reality is because of the pandemic and most of us living our lives mostly at home now, shopping online is absolutely a mandatory thing just to get by. Budgets are getting tighter, everything is becoming more expensive. So the least you can do is find a way to save some cash at checkout. So why not do it with a free shopping tool that allows you to get coupons instantly? Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. And that's because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. I've been able to find discounts on everything from new audio equipment to clothing to pizza for D&D groups, which I've recently been harping on, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment on that. But Honey is a great tool to find you ways to save money, anything from 10% to I've even had Honey find me a 40% off coupon before when I was shopping for, I can't remember what it was. I, was, I, was, I know I was shopping for clothes though, I forgot the store, but they found me a 40% off coupon. And I tell you, that was a good day. And now Honey doesn't just work on desktop, but it also works on your iPhone. You can activate it on Safari and just save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I wouldn't recommend something I don't use. And I've been using Honey for, I think like five years at this point. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash MLM. That's joinhoney.com slash MLM. And speaking of not wanting to go out and having things come to you, what about when it comes time for dinner? There's been a massive recent spike in COVID. As many of you know, I got it myself about a month, month and a half ago after staying so safe for these past two and a half years and doing my part, and yet I still got it. And I feel like a lot of friends around me that have all been protecting ourselves also got it too. So what do you do when you want delicious food, but you don't wanna go out and get it? Well, maybe you can try HelloFresh because with HelloFresh, you'll get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can choose from over 55 weekly options featuring pre-portioned high quality ingredients picked at peak ripeness. HelloFresh delivers fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week. So you can savor summer flavors right from home. And their recipes are pretty much foolproof. They're step-by-step -step recipes with pictures. So it means you'll have a joyful cooking experience and a stress-free summer. Plus, HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. And again, I've mentioned this time and time again, I really love their one pan meals. It is one of the best things in the whole world. It's easy cleanup, easy food, and it's delicious. So if you're ready to get started, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash MLM16 and use code MLM16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Again, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash MLM16 and use code MLM16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. While there can truly be no happy ending to a story that led to years of trauma and torment for the women involved, there can be a form of justice. And that's exactly what people were hoping for as the trials and prosecution of the Nexium ringleaders came to a close. The charges against the four leaders, Keith, Claire Bronfman, Allison Mack, and Nancy Salzman were staggering. Keith had been charged with racketeering, forced labor, sex trafficking, and child abuse, to which he of course pled not guilty. Meanwhile, the three women who had been his loyal disciples for years took a different route. Allison pled guilty to racketeering, Claire to visa fraud, and Nancy to racketeering. Mac made an impressive turn against Keith, though in my opinion, her actions cannot be excused. And I personally feel it hard to forgive her for the horrors that she helped orchestrate against countless women. While she didn't testify during the trial, she did provide video evidence of the brandings and participated in hours of interviews with prosecutors. In return, the United States attorney wrote a letter to the judge to request leniency in her sentencing, which she did get. After years of participating in the torment and abuse of other women under the instruction of Keith, Allison Mack was sentenced to three years in prison and a $20,000 fine. She did appear to be sympathetic towards her actions and apologized for her role saying, "'I am sorry to those of you that I brought into Nexium. I am sorry I ever exposed you to the nefarious and emotionally abusive schemes of a twisted man. I am sorry that I encouraged you to use your resources to participate in something that was ultimately so ugly. So what of the other women convicted of their heinous crimes? Well, Nancy, who many called Keith's enabler, was sentenced to three years in prison. While she didn't seem to be involved in the DOS cult directly, she pled guilty to racketeering for her involvement in creating Nexium, recruiting members and ensuring their continued involvement. At her sentencing, one victim made a statement. Salzman knew my condition yet did nothing to help. Instead, she leveraged my suffering against me, 
used it as further justification for her abuses and exploitation. Nancy, like Mac, apologized for her actions and told the court she was horrified and ashamed that she had worked with and helped to grow Keith's reputation. Again, I find it incredibly hard to forgive her, but that's just me. Nancy's daughter, Lauren, was also convicted of racketeering, but because she testified against Keith, she never received any time in prison. Then there was the financier, Claire. After nine members of Nexium testified against her, she received six years, nine months in prison. So what of Keith? Was he apologetic? Did he admit to his wrongdoing? Make any attempt to apologize to his victims? No. In fact, at the opening and closing statements of his trial, his lawyer was adamant that Keith had done nothing wrong. He referred to DOS as merely a social club and argued that the followers of Keith's, AKA the women he had brainwashed, branded, and practically imprisoned made adult choices. He also claimed that Keith didn't need DOS to generate intimate partners. This was simply his lifestyle. Thankfully, the jury wasn't buying any of that bullshit. After seven weeks of hearing testimonies, seeing the evidence, and watching on as women tearfully shared their stories of Keith's abuse and trauma that they had faced at the hands of this absolute monster, the jury decided on Keith's guilt in just five hours. But even after his conviction, Keith claimed to have done nothing wrong. After being sentenced to 120 years in prison and ordered to pay $3.5 million to his victims, Keith remained unremorseful. He said, I do believe I am innocent of the charges. It is true I am not remorseful of the crimes I do not believe I committed at all. While he maintains his innocence and continues to be the absolute worst example of a human being, many women are trying to rebuild their lives. The $3.5 million from Keith has in part been ordered to be used for branding removal. I can't imagine both the emotional and physical pain that is associated with that. And the fact that he just carries on believing he's still a good guy makes it so much worse. Though I wouldn't accept an apology from him, even if he made one. In a bizarre twist, people gathered outside of Keith's prison to dance, play music, and even do backflips. While the group claims that they do this in support of Kay Rose and other people in the prison, there is no Kay Rose. Composed almost entirely of former Nexium members of the group, We Are As You, has used to cover up stories of supporting people incarcerated during COVID-19 to show their undying support for Keith. Mark Vicente, a former member said, it's a cover movement for Keith, it's a Trojan horse. Why are all the key figures Rainier loyalists? This is all in tribute to Rainier. So there's that. Even after all the horrendous things he's done, people are dancing outside his prison cell. Like you just, you can't make this shit up. And by far, this is one of the toughest MLMs to cover because the reality here is there are no happy endings. While justice seems to have been served, at least to some of those involved, there is nothing that can give these women part of their lives back. It's heart-wrenching and maddening, and I just hope that survivors are able to hopefully one day be okay. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you learned something new here today, and I hope that this kind of combination of previous episodes to be one big one is more conclusive and more put together and easier to understand from start to finish. Again, I hope you did learn something new from this episode. It is never pleasant to reopen the books and looking inside of Nexium, as I'm sure many of you can imagine. I do obviously keep the sources for every single one of my episodes in the description box. If you do choose to rummage in through those sources, I do warn you that particularly for this episode, you can read the transcripts of all of the things that were said by all of the women that came forward. And I tell you now, it is one of the hardest things I've ever, ever had to take a look at. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. I will hopefully see you in another one that's maybe not so dark. And in closing, fuck Keith Rainier. 